All right, welcome to the REI Diamond Show, Ken. How are you doing today? Doing great. About yourself? Fantastic. Um, good time of year here, midsummer, and you know things are things are going well. The economy's still holding together, and stock market's up, right? <laughs> That's right. Yes, sir. At the moment, cool. So, Ken, um, can you give our listeners a little bit of background history, sort of what your career was, what it developed into now in the real estate space? Sure, sure. So, it, my career has actually taken a number of turns over the years. Um, I initially uh, got my finance degree from Toledo, Ohio, and uh, became a commercial lender for five years uh, with a small regional bank, or well, what at the time was small, it's large now. Uh, and then after about five years of that, I decided I wanted to be a CPA. So I went out and got my CPA license and spent seven years at Deloitte in their tax practice, doing M&A work, uh, working with a lot of private equity funds, uh, a, lot of, a lot of fun doing that. And then uh, at some point there, I bought a, uh, some Cessna pilot centers. Uh, most, most people don't make the jump from accounting to uh, flying airplanes, but I did. It was a lot of fun. We owned uh, three Cessna pilot centers for a, a number of years and uh, really enjoyed that business. Um, but uh, all through that time, I jumped into real estate uh, back in 1997 and uh, have uh, not looked back since. So it's all we do now, 100% uh, apartments, and uh, we... We're a vertically integrated real estate company, and uh, we, we do our own investments. Uh, we raise money, syndications, and funds, as well as uh, do third-party management. All right. Sounds good. So tell me about the the flying. Do you still fly yourself at all? You must, right? I mean, it's something- Actually, that... no. I, actually, no? I, I have other people fly me. Yeah. No, so no, uh, I do. I fly commercially now. Um, I, I have my private pilot's license. I didn't. I wasn't the one that actually instructed- um, we, you know, I own the company, so, uh, haven't done it in a number of years, um, miss it, but it, it was a lot of fun. No, no yeah, I, uh, I briefly got into flying, took a couple lessons and was thinking about getting a license maybe, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, moved far, far away from that airfield. So kind of moved on from that idea myself, but yeah, being up in those, uh, Cessnas is a completely different experience than flying commercially <laughs> it it is but you know what the world the world becomes a smaller place when you do that it's uh, it's really interesting uh, how it hmm. changes your perspective nice all right cool so let's talk um let's talk real estate investing what is the asset class that or classes that you are primarily focused on now as a company sure as a company we do bc class value add uh in uh, right now we're in central and northern florida um, but we stick to that asset class. We always have. We have always been a BC class value add investor. Um, and for lots and lots of reasons. I mean, first of all, it's the value add concept that we really enjoy. You've become pretty good at. Uh, but it's also uh, the BC class asset, which I think is really important because it's, it's the stuff that normal everyday people need, right? It's the largest part of the housing market and it gives us the most opportunities to take a property and make it much nicer after we're done than it was when we started. Nice. What are the, uh, what are the average ages of these properties that you, I, I guess an important thing too would be like, how, what's, what's the number of units under maybe management or already pri uh, invested and owned just to kind of give context of yeah, the experience? Yeah. Great question. So our, uh, our senior management team has managed about 15,000 units. So we're pretty deep in the experience. We currently manage about 2000 units in central and Northern Florida. Uh, so we're, we're still pretty deep. We're spread out in uh, Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, Daytona, and uh, soon to be up into the Panhandle. So, and, and we'll continue to grow from there. Uh, no, no question about that. Nice. Uh, what was the average age of these B2C unit buildings in those markets? Yeah, so typically 70s to early 2000s. Wow, they get to that new, huh? They do. Yeah, yeah. We actually have one asset uh, built in 2001 that uh, is performing very well for us. How about that? Uh, construction materials in Florida. Is this all block filled with concrete construction there? Not all of it. Nope, not all of it. Some of it's uh, uh, frame, some of it's block, some of it's stucco. It, it's a little bit of uh, all of the above. Okay, gotcha. Um, so... So your real estate firm, primarily, you're looking for passive investors, I believe, but I think you're kind of known, I believe you wrote the book and, 
and talked about real estate investing being like an active thing for most people. It is for me, certainly flip a lot of houses and own a lot of rental properties. And I'm constantly emailing and calling and checking management statements and making decisions. And if I were to put my head in the sand and try to treat it passively, like I was actually sold on the idea in Florida in 2006, when I went to the seminar to get into the business, um, (laughs) I'm sure I would lose and the deals would not be anywhere near as profitable as they are today. So what's the difference between active and passive investing? Yeah. So you're, you know, what happened to you is what I see happens to a lot of people. People generically (laughs) refer to what we do as passive investment. Well, what you and I do, there's nothing passive about it. Um, I have long held that, you know, we run a business just like the, the CPA firm I used to work at, just like the bank I used to work at. This is a business that just happens to be apartments. So that's how, everything that you do in a business, we do in the apartment world. We have employees, we have maintenance issues, we have customers, we have sales, we have reporting, everything. So, uh, you know, it, it's always uh, comical when, when people refer to any type of real estate investing as passive because uh, most of the time it's not. Now, we generally invest alongside our passive investors, right? We've been doing this for a long time. So we will do typically what a syndicator does we'll, or a fund manager, we're doing funds now but we'll go find a deal or raise the money and uh, put our own money in the deal as well. And that way our passive investors, you know, historically they've earned 15, 20, 30% annual returns, right? So it's really, really fun to be able to, to do that for folks that are just pat- legitimately passively investing and have nothing to do with the operations of the other property. So was 1997 the year that you began owning and running these syndication and apartment deals? Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, in the beginning, we didn't syndicate. And we didn't because uh, in 1997, I bought my first property. It was in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, it was a whopping 28 unit apartment building. Uh, but what was important about it is it was big enough that I could kind of run it as a business. It, by today's standards, it's small, but I could still hire someone to do it because at the time I was still working for Deloitte. And if you know anything about the CPA world, they work a lot. And so there was no way I was going to go turn apartments myself and everything like that. So we bought a 28 unit building. It was all with with my money and family money. And the first, I don't know, six or seven or eight deals, I don't remember now exactly, we did it with our own money. And we did that because I don't think it's fair to learn on someone else's dime. I just don't think that's fair to do. So we've We've tried to never do that. I mean, we're still learning today. So there's probably a little bit of that still going on. But, you know, the big mistakes I made early on, I did it with my own money. And uh, and and that way I didn't uh, have to worry about losing someone else's money uh, making a big mistake. Yeah, I feel like that's where I am. I don't take outside investor capital. I mean, our main business is buying and selling houses. And we've done, I think, 179 so far this year. So we're like really, really busy doing that wow. main business. So for me, rental property, uh, multifamily buildings, these are kind of like savings accounts and I buy them for, you know, a variety of reasons that we probably all already know. But um, I was asking because I'm I'm looking to try to put a timeline together of like, you know, uh, market cycles that occurred from like 97 to where we're at today. But I think a market cycle in northern and central Florida is going to be a little bit different than a Cleveland, Ohio market cycle. So maybe you could kind of like give us a timeline of uh when the ohio portion and then when the florida portion was kind of added in and then um we can kind of talk about how those cycles happened exist and maybe where we're at today yeah very that that's a really good question so we we the company originally grew up in cleveland in northeast ohio and we did we we bought properties for ourselves and we did some third party management that area generally is not uh, a third, it's not a, a third, doesn't require a third party management industry because most people that invest in Cleveland live in Cleveland. So it's an owner operator town. 10 or 15 years ago, uh, I needed, I, I felt like we, we were doing quite well in Cleveland, but I felt like we could do so much better if we had a basic economic structure that was better than, than what it was in Cleveland. So we began the process of looking in central and Northern Florida and that economic picture that I'm referring to, it's demand and supply. If you think about Cleveland, you know, generally Cleveland is not growing in population and, uh, and the, the, the housing stock and what we do is generally stable. So that puts sort of downward pressure on, on prices. 
Now compare that to Florida, about, about a thousand people are moving into Florida every year and they're not building BC class assets in Florida. They just can't because they can't afford to. The cost of construction are too high. So now we're in a situation where we really are in a bull market. We have increasing demand and stable supply that's going to put upward pressure on, on rents. It just will. That's, that's how economics works. So then when we put our value add strategy on top of a bull market, it just explodes. And that's exactly why we're in Florida. That's why we made the transition to Florida. And uh, that's why we're there. We're, we've really wound down generally what we do in Cleveland. There's nothing wrong with Cleveland. You just have to be more careful when you buy because you're not going to have the growth uh, prospects in front of you like you do in Florida. In Florida, you can make a little bit of a mistake on the buy side and you're going to earn your way out of it. Why? Because demands, you know, unless somebody thinks that people are going to stop moving to Florida, which I don't see that happening. I mean, it hasn't happened for decades now. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't see that demand breaking down. And that's, that's really what drives that whole market down there. Interesting. Do you remember what year it was you entered the Florida market first deal? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we actually bought in 14 or 15, something like that. It might have been 13. I don't remember exactly what day, to, what day, you know, what year it was. Okay. But it was post 08, 09 recession. I mean, we, we couldn't get in prior to that recession. Nothing made sense. <laughs> and so we just sat on the sidelines because it was just kind of obvious what was going to happen. We didn't fully understand why all those things were happening, but we could understand that it was going to happen. Yeah, got it. Are we at a spot like that now, do you think? I don't think so. And, and the reason is, um, you know, I went through the 08, 09 recession being a lender a CPA, I really got into the details about why, why did this happen? How did this happen? And there were, you know, a lot of things that came together. One, a lot of speculation. Two, people, you know, they were able to walk into a bank and tell them they made a million dollars a year, tell them they had $5 million in assets. It's called, I think they called it a no doc loan. I think yeah, ninjas or something, right? Nina's no income, no assets. Anita yeah, alone. no income, no assets. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, although that's not what they said. So you have that going on. <laughs> and, and in markets like Florida, you had people buying properties because they just knew that they could convert it to a condo, right? That whole condo conversion thing was going on. So they were buying properties that when you now you look back at that property, in no way would anyone buy a condo in that building. It just doesn't fit the mold. So but people were speculating. So they were buying four and five of these and then holding them for a couple of months and selling them again. So uh, so the bottom line in that 08, 09 recession was the banks drank the Kool-Aid as well. So usually what happens is lenders hold the line on lending criteria, right? They don't like to lend in situations where the debt service coverage is below 1.0. They just typically haven't liked to do that, but they made those exceptions. Hmm in 07, 08, 09. And they did it because they felt the need to be competitive. Now, compare that to now. I mean, deals that we're looking at, lenders are holding the line on, on the debt service coverage ratios, which is critical. So they're keeping everyone honest. They don't care what you pay, but they're only going to lend X on the property the way it is now. They know there's upside, but they're not going to drink that Kool-Aid uh, like they did back in 08 and 09. If you want to pay up, you have to use your own money to do that. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of the, that's the safety net that's in place right now. There are, there's a lot of money chasing deals in Florida, but there is true upside in these deals. Number one, number two, the lenders are holding the line. So the people just don't do ridiculous things. So I don't think it's this, I, I don't think it's the same at all. Now, remember I talked about the demand supply thing. If one of those two things were to break down, I might feel a little differently, but I don't, I mean, just think the demand side in Florida has not stopped for decades. It, I don't see that breaking down and they're not, they're not able to build BC class assets. So I'm looking for a demand supply issue to, to cause some concern for me. I don't see that happening. And I'm looking for lenders to do silly things and they're not, they're getting aggressive, but they're not doing ridiculous things like they did back then. Yeah, I've even seen them cool their jets a little bit in the last year. Well, obviously, since COVID, they cooled their jets significantly. It was, I mean, maybe that was a good pumping of the brakes for the banking industry, perhaps. I don't know. Um, but I do remember that post-recession, 08, 09, I remember you, you couldn't get credit. Like, uh, all the banks pulled the construction loans. So, like, you know, the construction jobs literally stopped mid-job. Uh, so, we had this, like, credit crisis that actually occurred to kind of freeze it up. 
we also had um you know millennials and the baby boomers were like at this weird specific age where the uh baby boomers were like done buying houses done buying first time and the millennials were like kind of just still in college like the front end of these two demographic waves we had like a, a lull in demand that occurred 08 09 uh, 10 i guess right. Right. Um, and then the other thing is like, remember the ticking time bombs that were built into the loans? They started at teaser rate and then they had, so like, you know, with the new licensing laws and um, consumer protections, like those uh, booby trapped loans are not sitting out there. So we don't That's have right. however many millions of loans. I mean, the only thing I think I probably worry about, Ken, is I think I saw a statistic if I, if I was not if I'm remembering the statistic correctly, in like 2010, when we had the highest number of foreclosures, I think it was like 2.8 million throughout the US. And I think there's like 1.3 was either like the average or what it was right before we went into COVID. And then I saw numbers of like between three and 4 million loans that are in this forbearance program thing. So we could see this like influx of single family inventory come on the market. Hopefully it happens over the course of uh, you know, various uh, legal processes in states throughout the country happen faster and slower in a variety of areas. So like that may take a three or a four year cycle to kind of, you know, properties go into foreclosure and they're kind of hopefully being um, consumed by the demand that we right. are counting on to be in the market. So, mm -hmm. yeah, unique time. I don't know. I guess I don't have a 100 percent answer, but um, I'm not like super worried, but I'm also not uh, super bullish either, which I think is the consensus among. Sure, you're cautious. As yeah, you should yeah. Be. yeah, you're cautious as you should be. And and you're specifically addressing the single family market. The multifamily market's got, I, I don't think, I, I don't, it's, it's not really happening uh, like that in the single family market. Very few people went into forbearance because quite honestly, it was brutal to do it uh, during COVID. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you it. could, but whew, it was not fun. Uh, I, I, uh, I know of people who looked into it and they just said, no way, we'll just write it out. Yeah, got it. So what uh, what about interest rate risk going forward? What keeps you up at night? Maybe other risks that are not as obvious as uh, demand cooling if, if job claims suddenly were ratcheting much higher. What are the risks that you or anyone else considering investing in multifamily should be aware of? Sure. So interest rate risk is a fair concern. Uh, we, we manage for that. We will buy rate caps. We'll do whatever we have to do to protect ourselves. One of the things that I didn't talk about that happened back in 08, 09 was uh, debt maturities, debt maturities that matured at the wrong time. And the banks, even though it was a good cash flowing asset and it was fine with good tenants and a good operator, they, they got foreclosed on anyway because their debt matured happened to be at the wrong time. So we're always really, really careful to manage our debt maturities and to do our best to stay away from short term stuff or make sure we have safety nets in place to protect against that. So, uh, and, and so the a rise in interest rates, when we look at our deals, we're using terminal cap rates that are higher than, you know, 3%. <laughs> Obviously we go six or 7%. We'll, we'll, we'll test it against that to see what, what the deal is going to look like. Probably the biggest difficulty right now in our business is really on the operations side. And that's the labor pool. That that's our biggest challenge right now. I mean, we're paying considerably higher than we ever have for, uh, for people. And, uh, you know, that's forcing us to get even more efficient in, with our use of technology and, and things like that to try to be as efficient as we can. Operationally, that's a challenge. You know, everybody always talks about rising interest rates, but I would remind you that if rates go up, what happens to home ownership costs? They go up as well, which tends to drive more people into the multifamily market. That's generally what happens now. So, so we're able to raise rents we still draft off it. We, I mean, we don't want cost of renting to be higher than the single family home cost. That, that doesn't make sense. But we know that in rising interest rates pushes more people in the multifamily. And we also know that the people, the generation below us, uh, they like to be mobile. They don't want to carry around a lot of baggage. They don't want to spend Saturday afternoon mowing the lawn, things like that. They want to be in a uh, in a maintenance-free kind of an environment that uh, multifamily provides for them. Plus some of the multifamily properties out there, they're so darn nice, they look like resorts. Um, and so they would much rather be in that situation rather than mowing their own lawn and not having a swimming pool and a beautiful outdoor grill and so on and so forth. So 
Yeah, I guess you're right. I never really thought of the apartment uh, space like that. I pay a, a freaking multiple for this condo that I live in, uh, which has the pool out there. And I, I like not having, you know, we travel for a week, two weeks, you know, n- not worried about breaking. Like when my neighbor down the hall is going to break into our, you know what I mean? So there's like a lot of benefit there for being in this multifamily property, which is just like a condo that I prefer that kind of living. And, and maybe I'm the, you know, the older end of the millennial <laughs> just outside of the millennial generation. And I think that trend is probably is probably pretty strong and, and can will continue to be. So I have a lot of guests, Ken, who are on the show and do things that are similar to you. One of the things that kind of stands out as a trend lately is this uh, probably scaling up to another level. And I'm, I'm curious um what drove the transition from going from like syndicating i guess single deals or a small package to now doing a fund and then what is the progression of that scale for a company like yours or another company does it ultimately end up in the REIT area where it becomes like another level of scale and access to capital and maybe some challenges along the way yeah so that's a really good question and and let me tell you my thoughts on that first of all we're making the switch We've made the switch from the syndication model to the blind pool fund model, really out of necessity. So Florida is a competitive market, right? Syndicators go find the deal, then they go raise the money. But in order to find that deal, they have to convince that seller that they're, the seller has to accept that equity raise risk, right? So, so sellers know that if they go under contract with a syndicator, there's that chance that they can't raise the money or something's going to happen and, and the deal's going to fall through. Typically, syndicators are less experienced. Typically, syndicators have that equity raise issue. So when we flip to the fund environment, things completely change. The funds are already raised. Now we go to the seller. We have set ourselves, we generally stay in the under 200 unit space. There are very few fund managers chasing around sub 200 unit deals. They just, there just are very few. So that makes us the big fish in the pond. So when a seller considers going under contract with us, they know, well, first of all, you're a blind pool fund. So obviously, you know, you appear to be more experienced than, than a typical syndicator. They certainly believe that the due diligence might be more efficient because of that level of experience. And that whole equity raise risk is off the table. So there's a lot of reasons for a seller to go under contract with a fund manager. So it, we did it for the sole purpose of being more competitive to get deals. It wasn't because I wanted to spend months going out and raising lots of money. So our first fund here, we're wrapping it up right now. It's going to be around 11, 12 million bucks. It's a small fund, but it's a first time fund. So our growth prospect uh, is going to be, and let me talk for a minute about why, why I'll say what I'm saying. The next fund, as soon as we deploy this capital, we'll go on to the next fund and the fund after that and the fund after that. We'll just continue to grow the size of the fund. Uh, it commensurate with our ability to grow out our infrastructure to support that. That's important because you don't want an infrastructure or you don't want to grow to the point where your infrastructure can't support it. Now, you had talked about a REIT as an exit. I mean, REIT is a potential exit for anybody that as we continue to, to accumulate units, we typically aren't a unit accumulator because our value add model means that we're going to go in, we're going to add our value, we're going to leave some meat for the, on the bone for the next guy, and then we're going to sell that property and move on and then repeat the process. But I, if, if you think about since the Job Act, Jobs Act in 2012, which made it possible for us to even have this conversation about us raising funds in a, in a public environment and uh, fall into the SEC exemption, I think that this, I call it this private capital market, is going to continue to evolve and grow as a way that people have an alternative, right? They think of this as alternative investing and it kind of is, although it's becoming far more mainstream than it used to be. And so I think that more and more people will look to this as a mainstream investment um, over, you know, doing REITs and things like that. So that's my belief. I I would be surprised if we went to a REIT structure as as an exit I think we'll just continue to grow our our capital size and therefore the the types of properties that we buy, the size of the properties that we buy, and so on and so forth. So I think this has a long runway ahead of it in, the, in this private capital market. Yeah, and I mean a, a fifteen to twenty percent return on a yearly basis is pretty freaking strong. 
<laughs> I don't know if there are a ton of REITs that are doing that. So I guess in my mind, it's like, you know, you build a company, you grow it, you go public because you get this kind of ridiculous multiple. So it's like, is there a, is there the same opportunity for a ridiculous multiple if somebody were, I mean, and not that it's just your strategy, but could somebody kind of compile their 3,800 unit, uh, four different pools and do some <laughs> kind of like public offering and then the investors benefit from like a windfall at this larger multiple at the public market level? Or is that just hogwash? Well, sure. I, I don't know why they couldn't. I'm, we've not looked into that, right? We're that that's, that's pretty far down the road. So I'm, you know, the whatever uh, 10, 15 years from now, things are going to, I believe they're going to look a lot different. So for me to plan that exit right now is extremely premature. I mean, we're just, we're way too young for that. Uh, Got it. it doesn't make sense. So I, I wouldn't really be able to comment on that. But if you think about what we do, if, so when we exit, either we sell or we refinance, get all the money back. And now people are earning money on nothing and they reinvest it in the next mm -hmm. deal. I mean, you're just talking about massive wealth creation. You know, we didn't talk about why I'm here in real estate today, right? and not trying to figure out how to trade stocks and things like that. Real estate is generally valued on its ability to create cash flow, right? It just is. That's the way it's always been. And so I'm able to affect that cash flow by raising rents and doing things like that. Because I'm able to re increase the cash flow of the property, that means that I'm able to increase the value of the property far more predictably then I can if I just put money in the stock market, right? And that's that's one of the reasons that I like it. That's one of the reasons that I think people should really have real estate as a significant part of their wealth building plan because there's it's just so much more predictable than a stock. I mean, you know, stocks are going up and down regularly. Um, and with based on what reason, I don't know. Sometimes I have difficulty connecting a drop in the stock market to what, why. Why did this really happen? The company was the same yesterday as it as it was today. Why is it worth ten percent less? Right, nothing nothing has happened that really is going to have that impact. You don't get that in the real estate world. Yeah, it makes sense. Do you actually invest in any other asset classes, or is it uh, you know personally like exclusively the real estate deals? Yeah, I mean I, I have idle cash in some short term investments and some you know some stocks and things like that, but it is not it's not how we create wealth. For ourselves gotcha gotcha yeah, we, yeah, we're all I, in real estate i do too and i guess that's the same thing it's like i can you know blow out all my stocks even if the market goes down 50 percent. if i like needed to access the cash but like me selling my you know seven and ten unit buildings might be like a kind of an arduous process especially if the market got soft you know right 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 yeah. but what what's important is that you know we are we invest in our own fund Obviously, we should. That's what any sponsor should do. Any fund manager should have his own skin in the game. So we're, we're all in on the real estate side. I mean, if real estate were to completely get destroyed and never come back, well, then I would I would have a problem. But I don't know. I don't see that happening. People, so, and, and go back to why people need a place to live. We're not investing in office buildings. We're not investing in retail. We're not investing in warehouses. We're not investing in a triple net lease. I mean, you got to find some reason to convince me that people don't need a place to live anymore. Yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we're there. And if I can eke out 15, 20, 30% annual returns with an asset that I can't figure out how to make it go away, I like that. Why wouldn't I want to be all in on that? See, that's how I look at it. Yeah, I think it's smart. So as you scale funds, um, I'm going to assume like we have high net individual, uh, high net worth individuals, doctors, lawyers, people who have some cash on the sidelines uh, are are probably some portion of it. Uh, maybe on the twelve million dollar fund, maybe on future funds. Who are the additional players that would be participating at perhaps higher capital levels, if any, as you grow? Sure. Well, now, the typical next level for us, us is we continue to work with wealth management firms. Who, who want to put their clients in it, family offices, who, who they, family offices heavily invest in real estate because their goals are to protect uh, the downside and just continue to, you know, protect the family, uh, the family wealth and, and grow income. So uh, that is typical. And then of course, 
as you continue to grow the size, you're going to get institutional investments and things like that. Again, that's that's a little ahead of our game right now. You know, I I tend to, because I think things change on a regular basis, I tend to be sort of short term. My next plan is going to be to continue to grow our family office investment pool, our wealth management investment pool, as well as uh, as well as high net worth individuals. Um, you know, there's there's you know millions of them. Uh, in in this country, and it seems like it would take a long time to exhaust that. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what is the duration typically of the blind pool, the blind fund that you guys have? I mean, yeah. number of deals, years, that kind of thing. Yeah, good question. So, our typically we hold on our value add fund uh, three to five years an asset. So the fund itself is, uh, I think it's a six year fund with three one year extensions. And the, the idea here is that we want to have time to liquidate uh, the assets that are in the fund and then move on to the next one. So again, one of the things that's critical with a value add investment fund is it's not our goal to build units. I'm not trying to get 10, 20, 30,000 units, right? I, that's not the goal for this fund. I mean, in a future fund, it'll be a longer term play. But you know, one of the things that you learn when, in our, when you're in our business and you talk to investors they love to get in. That's the first happiest day of their life. The second happiest day of their life is when we write that big check <laughs> and they're out because then they know the deal has gone full cycle. There's, it can't get screwed up. It, it's legit. I have cash in my bank. You cannot argue with, I, did I make money on this investment? Yes. Here's how much I made. There's no way that can change because it's a done deal, right? So you'll learn that uh, investors, those are the two happiest days of an investor's life. And so we try to balance that against um, other funds that we'll have in the future that will say, okay, no, the, the, the plan with this fund is maybe a seven to 10 year hold where we're going we're gonna to get your money back after four or five years and then continue to hold the asset for a while and let you earn money on no, no investment at all. Nothing wrong with that. Hmm. But again, what's important is <clears throat> that we communicate carefully the objective of the fund so that the investors have an expectation as to what we're going to do, because I don't think that's fair to do it any other way. Yeah, that makes sense. I uh, am blessed to make decent money, but that comes with a large tax bill at the end of the year. So some for me, some of it's like I don't ever really want to have the big capital gain come down the pike with the stuff that I bought personally, you know, smaller right. real estate. And I've stayed away from the syndications for that reason, um, just because it's like I kind of did all the work to park the cash and I don't really want to have to pay, you know, the tax on that later on. Uh, that said, with my mindset probably differs from a lot of people who are listening right now. Is there a tax strategy portion um, with your deals, accelerated depreciation, just sure. straight line. I mean, you know, how do you approach that aspect? Yeah, we'll do cost seg studies. I'm sure you've heard of those mm -hmm. on, on acquisition. So that accelerates a lot of the depreciation. We have to be careful with that though, because that can generate recapture when you sell. Mm -hmm. People don't necessarily always understand that. So we want to be really careful with our investors so that they understand what that means. Um, you know, what what's happening on the tax side uh, you know, will people prefer to have capital gains over ordinary income? Yeah, right now, absolutely. It's about half, the marginal rates are half. So you, you can't beat that. Now, for someone who does want to be able to get their money back, continue to earn income on that, it, it, the next fund or a future fund, it might be a longer term hold fund that would probably be more consistent with your tax objectives, right? Longer term. Right. Other things that people will do, they'll hold this stuff inside an IRA. There's some UBIT issues and, and debt financed income there. Uh, you're still saving on taxes, but a lot of people invest in our fund through IRAs, which is a real, um, it, it's a really good idea because IRAs are long-term by nature. Real estate is long-term by nature. So you still get some tax benefits. You don't get 100% uh, of the tax benefits because of the debt that's involved in buying real estate, but you at least get a significant break uh, on, on the sale on those capital gains taxes. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, 15, 20%, you're probably doubling your money, what, every five years, maybe? Yeah, I, yeah, I haven't, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. So, back So, imagine if you're in our fund and you earned 30% annual return. We just sold a deal in Orange City. Uh, we were in it for two years and a month. And our investors, the annual return on investment was 38%. 
Nice. So that's capital gains. So take 15 points off of that, 20 points. You still did very, very well. Yeah, you're not how many How many 18%, 20% after tax returns are people earning? Yeah, not not many. <laughs> the problem is now you set the bar super, super high, so everyone's going right. to be disappointed from here on out. <laughs> nah, nah, we'll, we're going to continue again. to try to get close to that. Yep. We'll, I like it. I like it. You know, we'll, we'll do our best. We'll do our best. So, Ken, how do you mitigate risk when it comes to turning over, doing this value add, you know, construction, improvements, things of that nature? How do you decide what to do? Is there some other strategy that you can kind of highlight in that aspect? Yeah, really good. Really good question. So, first of all, we're vertically integrated. That means we do all everything ourselves because execution is really, really important. I can't tell you how many times I've watched people screw deals up, had a great plan going in, but they didn't execute it very well. So we always execute our own plans. Now, we, we set our plan when we go under LOI, we revise that plan after due diligence, and then we do something really weird. When we take possession of the asset, we sit on it for 30 or 60 days. Why? Because we wanna learn about all the things the seller didn't tell us, because you know they don't tell you everything. So we revise at a final time then and then as we're going through the process, we're constantly asking ourselves, is this still the right thing to do based on everything that we know today? So we're constantly reevaluating that plan. Now, the plan generally starts from the outside and works its way in. With our size properties, I love to create amenity packages and make them as nice as I can because think about how you would sell anything, right? Prospective renter shows up, you need to impress them, right? It's called curb appeal, it's not a new concept but we always want to make sure we focused on that. Believe it or not, a lot of people think start on the inside because that's where people live. They don't live outside, they live inside. So let's focus on the inside, but I'll tell you why you don't want to do that. So if we start on the outside, we want to make sure the curb appeal is good. Then we get them into our leasing office, which has to be nice. And then our tours always start with our amenity packages. And we like to be able to show off our pools, our nice pool furniture, our outdoor kitchen, our outdoor TV, our dog park or whatever it is that we have. And what we try to do is we try to tell that story of you, your family. Uh, imagine uh, mom, dad, and the kids coming to the pool. They, dad can cook uh, lunch on the grill right there. Kids can swim all day. Mom and dad can take turns working out in the fitness center, which is right there. Oh, and by the way, they don't have to miss the football game because it's on the outdoor TV, right? So this is real, This, I mean, this is how people live in a well amenitized property. And we can do this with BC class assets. It's really not that hard. So we focus on that. Now, after we do that, we then take them to their unit. And now our job is to just not let them down when we open the door, right? We manage the way it looks, obviously, all the way to their unit. And then inside the unit, we just need to make sure it's consistent with what we've done on the rest of the property. That's important. Now, compare that to somebody who works from the inside out. Think about how hard it is when the outside doesn't look fantastic. The inside looks really, really cool inside that apartment. Problem is what's between that prospect and that apartment, an exterior, no curb appeal. It's all your money's behind a locked door. So you wanna be really, really careful doing that. Yes, residents live inside their units and yes, they have to be nice, but you have to make sure you can get them to the front door. If, if you put all your money behind that locked door, you might be in trouble. Just be really, really careful with that. I've seen people do it and it turns out to be a mess because they can never upgrade their resident base because that good resident, they'll drive up, they just keep right on going and they turn into a no-show and the leasing agent doesn't understand why all these people stop, they don't show up for their scheduled appointments. They, they were there, most likely. They just kept right on going because it wasn't what they thought it should be. And you never even got to show them the beautiful granite countertops and everything else that you did inside that unit. So that's kind of our, from a high level, that's our process. And that's why we do it that way. And it's uh, so far served us very well. Yeah, I think it's smart. I mean, I imagine I'm going out on a limb with the assumption that you could probably get, uh, you know, $1,200 for a property that was updated 15 years ago in a building that had the nice amenity, same apartment, granite counters, outside looks, you know, not that great. And the, the inside's like stellar, superb, far be beats the other one that's not updated. 
probably the same 1200 or maybe even less because they're so um the first impression right yeah curb yeah. appeal yeah Smart. yeah no it, it matters because you can't get that upgraded resident to the front door of that apartment if it doesn't look good <laughs> because as soon as they drive up as soon as they turn in they're already whether they're doing it consciously or not they're drawing their own conclusions about what this what living here is like because also remember and they're not always thinking about this but they have to invite their friends and mm. their boyfriend and their girlfriend to the property and they don't want to be embarrassed right <laughs> that's it's that's the way we look at it and we give them every reason to be able to impress their friends wow this place is really cool then they go inside and say oh wow it's even it's cool inside too right that's what we want that's what we're going for it's all about yeah, the sales it's all about selling creating a full experience there what what yeah. would be the budget walking into an average deal i mean what do you expect to spend a quarter million it's so all over the map yeah i mean we the orange city deal i think we spent three and a quarter something like that 350 i don't remember exactly uh, we did a deal in jacksonville we spent 850 so it, okay. it just depends on what's needed what's really important though if you're in our chair and you're doing what we do is that you're constantly evaluating what you're spending your money on and ask yourself that question ask yourself that payback question <clears throat> if you're going to spend a thousand dollars are you going to get more rent for it now if it's deferred maintenance and some things you can't apply that logic to you just got to suck it up and do it but what you want to do is constantly challenge yourself and make sure that if you do something is it going to lead to higher rents because you should, if you're going to make an investment, you need to get a return on it. And the way we get return in our business is ancillary fees or higher rents or something like that. Makes sense. Um, before we get to a couple wrap up questions here, Ken, I have a question with your CPA background history. Uh, I will caveat this one by uh, saying that this does not necessarily have to be specific to real estate. But I want you to describe the most innovative tax strategy that you've seen executed in the past 24 months by anyone or even any corporation that you know or even read about. Yes, that's uh, that's a good question. So I don't I don't talk to too. I, I'm not a practicing CPA, so I don't talk to okay. a lot of external people um, about uh, what they're doing. I will tell you, probably. I mean, the 1031 exchange people do regularly. Um, that, that's not extraordinary by any stretch. Uh, the cost segregation uh, projects that are done, th those are really important. Um, I think there's some folks doing things out there with different types of trusts and things like that to help uh, shelter the income. Uh, that would be way above and beyond my pay grade to even talk about on this show. Uh, but I know there's some folks doing things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing I would caution people about just be careful with your tax planning strategy and make sure you understand what it means long-term. For example, the cost seg. I mean, I'm nothing wrong with cost seg studies and we do them and they're gonna drive, they're gonna give you huge depreciation deductions. Well, make sure the sponsor that you're working with didn't specially allocate all the depreciation to themselves because sometimes they do that because they're making the assumption that the investors are passive and they couldn't take it anyway. So be mm -hmm. mindful of those kinds of things. I think that's important, right? That's some of the, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that's some of the vetting the sponsor kind of things that I, I want people to pay attention to. But think about, okay, what happens when they sell that asset? And think that through, because it could generate recapture income. Recapture income means they're gonna, that depreciation deduction that you took, they might be able to claw that back and charge you ordinary income rates for some of that. Just depends on how the depreciation is taken. So um, there, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of really super creative things left in the real estate world other than what I've talked about, but I don't know how creative you need to be. When you think about it, you invest in a fund like ours, you're going to get a K-1. That K-1 is probably going to show a tax loss on it because of the depreciation that we take. You're not going to get paid tax when we do distributions. We're not going to send you five grand and hold back, you know, $1,000 in withholding, right? That's not how it works. So you're going to get that five grand, it'll reduce your capital, but it's not going to create a taxable event for you. So now you're getting money out of an investment that when you look at your K-1, depending on how you're going to handle it on your personal tax return, you have the ability to either take the loss or carry it forward to offset it against future income, but you got cash out of that. 
you got cash out of an investment that you didn't have to pay tax on. Now, fast forward, you do that for years and years, your tax basis goes down. And so when that asset is sold, you're going to have capital gains tax. Think about that. You, you got cash out, reduced your basis, so you could pay tax on it later, but at a capital gains rate, not the ordinary income rates, assuming no significant laws have changed between now and then. So yeah, I, I think there's already a lot of tax benefits built into the real estate world um, for lots of reasons. Uh, I think the politicians, uh, I think probably almost all of them are in real estate, so they probably get it. And uh, I don't see that changing in a huge way anytime soon. But go back to please don't make real estate investments solely for the tax benefit. Don't do that. You want your transaction to make sense economically first, and then let the tax be the icing on the cake, right? Certainly don't want to turn it away, but don't invest in things that lose money <laughs> so you can get a tax benefit. That is, don't laugh. People used to do it. They don't, wow. I, you know, I don't, I don't uh, subscribe to that theory, obviously, but uh, people sometimes get, they let the tax tail wag the dog. And I don't, I don't like to see people do that. Yeah, it makes sense. Is it possible to 1031 out of the $200,000 investment that's made with KRI partners when the time comes? Is that like... Yeah, that's, that's going to be nearly impossible. So what, what okay. would have to happen? And even with a syndicator, 1031, you have to actually, it's a like kind exchange concept. And so when you're in a syndication, when you're in a fund, you're owning an interest in an LLC or a limited partnership, right? So that interest that you have is not the real estate directly. So okay. what would have to happen, let's say you were in a syndication and there were five partners in that syndication, that asset probably would have to be distributed up and all the partners would have to hold the asset directly be on the deed. And then they could, when it's sold, they could take a look at their share of the gain and then potentially 1031 into another asset of like kind, right? Another piece of real estate when we sell a property out of a syndication, the asset is sold, but you are, you own the interest in the entity. You don't own the actual asset. So that tends to screw up 1031s. Got it. That makes sense. So what else do we need to know about vetting a partner before I send off money to, uh, you know, syndicator fund, et cetera? Yeah. So, uh, well, a lot of things, first of all, um, I, you know, I'll talk about my uh, book here in a second, but uh, probably the biggest thing that's happened recently in improving our ability to vet sponsors is a company called Veravest. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Um, relatively new company. They have some other businesses as well. They exist for the sole purpose of vetting sponsors like ours, like mm -hmm. us. For example, we signed up with them, paid them a bunch of money. And we had to send them 23 years of tax returns, settlement statements, operating agreements. They ran a full background check on me, did a criminal background check, checked me out with the SEC. And they're going to do that every year going forward. And they're, every time we do a distribution or something like that, they're going to look at our operating agreement and make sure that we followed our operating agreement, right? They're monitoring what we do. So it's Big Brother looking over our shoulder. Remember, I talked about the I talked about the private this private capital market having a huge runway in front of it. I think it it is critical to have a company like Veravest involved in this environment because the industry needs somebody looking over people's shoulders. So mm -hmm. now, when an investor signs up with me, I make sure they go to the Veravest site, our page on the Veravest site, and they look at our track record. They see the buy, the sell, the dates, the they recalculate the gains. I mean, it's, it's completely verified, right? So we call it Veravest verified. Now I'm not, I have no interest in the company, but here's why I bring it up. I bring it up because I, prior to them existing, I, I can't figure out a really good way for the ordinary person to vet a sponsor. What ordinary person is going to look at 23 years of my tax returns or settlement statements? They're just not going to do it. I mean, it's a massive amount of work. So the fact that they're here really, I think, create, reduces a lot of friction in this private capital market. So I'm thrilled that they're here. We signed up. It costs us a lot of money to do it. But I think it is so critical that if you're, a, if you're sitting in your chair or one of your listeners wants to invest with a sponsor, that if they're Veravest verified, that should give them a lot of comfort uh, that 
somebody's looking over their shoulders and they're third party. They're not allowed in our deals. They can't. That would be a, an impairment of their independence. So that is a huge deal that I think is critical. And hopefully, I don't, maybe there's other companies out there that do it. If, they, if there are, I don't know about them. But I think that's critical to the long-term health of this industry. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to a long relationship with them. Yeah, that's decent. It seems, uh, you know, the other ways of doing it or, you know, vetting the team and this and that. It's like, how do you vet the team? You listen to a couple podcasts that they did. I mean, sit in on a couple of the, uh, you know, earnings calls from prior right. investments. It's like a very opaque underwriting method compared to, yeah, anything else. It's hard. Know, it's hard. It's yeah. very difficult. And I, that, I, that's why I called it friction, right? Because people have this nagging... They, they're not sure, at least the investors we talk to, they're not sure how much should I ask? You know, we'll even talk to investors and they're apologizing for the questions they ask. And I don't ever want them to do that. They should ask me a million questions. They should know every, you know, we try to be super transparent. We are extremely transparent or we wouldn't have hired a company like Verivest to really put us under the microscope. So I think it's critical. I think uh, investors have not had the ability to, to, to get access to this type of, you know, information that is uh, more accurate, right? Because it, it just they couldn't do it before. So I could put anything they want down on the piece of paper, throw it out on the internet, and do you believe it? I don't know. Ken seems like a nice guy. Is he? Is he telling the truth? Now you have an objective way to know that, and I think that's huge. Nice. All right, Ken. So book recommendations. Do you want to mention your book and maybe one or two <laughs> others that are out there? Yeah, absolutely. Out? So my book, you got to go to kripartners.com slash ebook. It's free, kripartners.com slash ebook. So the, the name of the book is Multifamily uh, Real Estate is a Total Game Changer. I wrote the book myself. It is not long. It's 40, 50 pages long. But I wanted to address two things that I find everybody facing. The first is... Um, they know people are making a ton of money in real estate, right? But they're just trying to figure out how they fit into it. I suspect a lot of your listeners are trying to figure that out. You said you do a lot of single family. Is that right for them? Maybe they should be a duplex. Maybe they should do 10 unit. Maybe they shouldn't be doing it themselves at all. Maybe they're a physician and they should invest passively. What kind of real estate should they get involved with? Should it be triple net lease? Should it be a warehouse? Should it be single tenant facility? What should they do? So I take them through that process because it's a question that absolutely every single person that considers real estate faces. They're trying to figure out how should they do this? How should they get involved? Because there's a lot of money there. They just don't know how to get involved. They're trying to figure it out. Then now it's been my experience. Most people should passively invest because they've got legitimate, really good full-time jobs, right? I, I've had physicians want to throw up, throw in the towel to come into real estate. I'm like, time out. Don't do that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> no, stop, stop. It's not, it's not as fun as you think, but they should passive invest. So I think most people should passively invest. So then we get to that issue of vetting sponsors. So the second part of the book, I talk about how to vet your sponsors. And I try to give them some really good insight as to how this business really works. What makes sponsors tick? What makes them do what they do? Why did they do the things that they do and give them some things to look for that might be an indication that they're not maybe as investor friendly as they should be. So I go through that process. And of course, I talk a little bit about Verivest because I think it's an important part of, of the process. But, you know, that second part of the book helps them understand how to vet sponsors. And I really reinforce the fact that you got to look for experience and don't be afraid to ask questions. And if, and if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't smell right, guess what? It's probably not. So don't, don't jump in. Don't just assume because the guy's on a podcast or, or on a YouTube video that he's legit, right? Just if it doesn't smell right, don't do it. Nice. And you don't have to be sorry. So other book recommendations, you know what? I read, uh, you know, I read constantly. Um, I mean, the list goes uh, on and on. I mean, I'm a huge fan of uh, uh, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series. No question about that. Um, I, I would recommend any reader read that. Um, in terms of other recommendations, you know, Grant Cardone has got a whole series of books on selling and, and really talking about the psychology of a buyer uh, and, and how really what we do every day, it doesn't matter whether you're doing what you do or I do what I do, we're selling, right? We're selling to our kids, our family, our neighbors. Uh, so those, you know, any of those books would probably be uh, good reads. Um, 
you know, I'm sure there's, uh, you know, the 10 X and all that stuff. All, all those uh, books are, uh, are relevant. And it really is, it seems like it comes from a guy that started like I did with really nothing. And it just takes a lot of grit to get it done and a lot of, a lot of hard work. And it seems like that's how he's grown up. So it's, it's fun to learn from people like that. Yeah, for sure. So crown jewel of wisdom, Ken, if you could go back, uh, let's say to 1997, knowing everything you know now, 2021, what would you share with yourself, 97, when you were getting started multifamily? Yeah, good question. So I have this 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 thought that I've developed. I don't know that it's my thought. I I, I don't want to. I can't give credit because I'm not sure if I if I even need to. But I believe that people are where they are because they have chosen to be there. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, early on, I didn't know I could fly an airplane. All of a sudden, oh my God, I learned how to fly an airplane. Uh, I didn't know I could learn how to scuba dive. Oh my God, I learned how to do that. And I didn't realize I could be a CPA and now I'm a commercial lender. And so I, I started realizing I, I could, you could do whatever you want. You just gotta go figure out how to make it happen. The first, very first apartment building. I remember the, the mortgage was $460,000 and I had to sign on it personally. See, I know, I remember this day vividly and I remember feeling what I thought was a golf ball in my throat. But I pushed <laughs> through it. It was, it was really stressful. Yeah. All of a sudden I realized, oh my God, I now own an apartment building. And then I sold it three years later and made a hundred grand. Holy crap, I made a hundred grand on the side. Are you kidding me? So that started making me realize, wait a minute. I'm limiting myself. That is the number one thing I want people to think about is stop limiting yourself because you really can, you just got to figure out how you can do these things. Don't think you can't, right? We just raised a 10, 11, $12 million fund. There's no question in my mind that we'll be able to raise a hundred, $200 million fund. It won't be tomorrow, but we'll definitely get there if that's what we want to do because because it just, we just have to figure out what needs to happen in order to make that happen. So that's the number one piece of advice. Uh, you know, you called it a jewel of wisdom, I think. Uh, that's it. And uh, I see people limit themselves every single day. And I preach this to my kids that, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want. It's, and it's really, really fun once you figure out that you can do whatever you want. It's fun to actually make it happen. Nice. Uh, do you have some contact info, place where people I do. Can get more Ken G? Yep, more Ken G. So kripartners.com. Uh, you can always email me, kge, that's k-g-e-e, -E, at kripartners.com. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly when this will air, but we're wrapping up a fund right now. If, if you're interested in investing, give us a buzz right away, because it might possibly still be open. Most likely, you'll, you'll at least get a chance to get to know us, put you on the waiting list for the next fund. Um, you can also call us 813-489-9666 and uh, talk to our investor relations people. And, uh, and uh, I try to talk to every single investor that comes on board. So at some point you'd have to talk to me anyway. So, nice. and, and I would go back to kripartners.com slash ebook. Take a look at this book, get on our mailing list because then you can, uh, you know, I, I write a lot of blog stuff that we put out and my goal is to just teach people more and more about this business because it's, it's, it's a fun business. And I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to be in, in it in some way, shape, or form. Nice. Cool. Uh, go check out the book. Go check out Ken G. Ken, I got a ton of value, ton of notes here myself. Great episode. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.